Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary by W.P. Livingston. Phase 4, 1902-1910, The Romance of the Inyong Creek. Chapter 1, The Reign of the Long Juju. Again had come the fullness of the time, and again Mary Slusser, at an age when most women began to think of taking their ease, went forward to a new and great work for Christ and civilization. Kind eyes and loving hands beckoned to her from Scotland to come and rest, but she gazed into the interior, towards vast regions as yet unentered, and saw there the gleam of the divine light leading her on, and she turned with a happy sigh to follow it. In this case there was no sharp division between the old and new spheres of service. For ten years she had been brooding over the conditions in the territory on the west side of the Cross River. So near at hand, so constantly skirted by missionaries, traders, and officials as they sailed up river, and yet so unknown, and so full of the worst abominations of heathenism. Just above Calabar, the Cross River bends back upon itself, and here at the point of the elbow, the Inyong Creek runs inland into the heart of the territory towards the Niger. At its mouth, on high ground, stands the township of Itu of sinister reputation in the history of the west coast. For there on the broad beach at the foot of the cliff was held a market, which for centuries supplied Calabar and the New World with slaves. Down through the forest paths, down the quiet waters of the creek, countless victims of man's cupidity had poured and been huddled together there, and had been inspected, appraised, and sold, and then had been scattered to compounds throughout the country, or shipped across the sea. And there still a market was held and along the upper borders of the cross, creek sacrifice and cannibalism was practiced. Only recently a chief had died, and sixty slave people had been killed and eaten. One day, twenty-five were set in a row with their hands tied behind them, and a man came with a knife and chopped off their heads. It is a strange irony that this old slave creek, the scene of so much misery and anguish, is one of the prettiest waterways in West Africa. It is narrow and still and winding, and great trees covered with the delicate tracery of creepers line the banks, their branches sometimes interlacing above, while the undergrowth is rich in foliage and blossom. Lovely orchids and ferns grow in the hollows of the boughs, and old trunks that have fallen. But the glory of the creek is its water lilies, which cover the surface everywhere, so that a boat has often to cut its way through their mass. On either hand, side creeks can be seen twisting among the trees, and running deeper into the heart of the forest. The silence of the primeval solitude is unbroken, save when a canoe passes, and then a startled alligator will slip into the water. Monkeys will scurry, chattering from branch to branch. Parrots will fly, screaming away. Blue kingfishers and wild ducks will disappear from their perch, and yellow palm birds will gleam for a moment as they flit through the sunlight. This creek is beautiful at all times, but in the early morning, when the air is cool and the light is misty, and the vistas are veiled in dimness, the scene is one of fairy-like enchantment. Above the creek, all the country between the Cross River and the Niger, up to near Lokoja in northern Nigeria, was occupied by the Ibo people, numbered about four million, of a fairly high racial type, who were dominated by the Eros clan, dwelling in some twenty or thirty sit towns situated close together in the district of Erochauka, god of the Eros. A remarkable and mysterious people, the Eros were light-colored, intelligent, subtle, and cunning. More intellectual and commercial than warlike, they developed two lines of activity, trade and religion, and made each serve the other. Their chief commodity was slaves. Each town controlled certain slave routes, and each had a definite sphere of influence which extended over a wide tract of territory. When slaves were secured, they engaged mercenaries to raid villages and capture them, but they had usually a supply from the Long Juju situated in a secret, well-guarded gorge. The fame of their fetishes was like that of the Delphic Oracle of old. It spread over the country, and people came far distances to make sacrifices at its shrine, and consult the priests on all possible subjects. These priests were men chosen by various towns who were raised to a semi-sacred status in the eyes of the people. Enormous fees and fines were imposed, but the majority who entered the spot never left it alive. They were either sacrificed and eaten, or sold into slavery. The shrine was built in the middle of a stream which was alive with ugly fish with glaring eyes that were regarded as sacred. When the friends of the man who had entered saw the water running red, they believed that the juju had devoured him. 
In reality, some red material had been cast in, and the man would be sent as a slave to a remote part of the country. The priests dispatched their emissaries far and wide. They settled in townships, swore blood brotherhood with the chiefs, and took part in local affairs. They planted farms, and traded, and acquired enormous power. When disputes arose, they got the matter set for adjustment to the town in Arrow, within whose sphere of influence they lived, or to the Long Juju. In this way they acted as agents of the slave system. Other men took round the slaves on different routes. Their usual plan was to leave one on approval, obtaining, on their own part, so much on each, or slave of lower value, when the trader returned and the bargain could be completed. The usual price of a new slave was two hundred or three hundred rods, and a bad slave. So widespread was the net, east by the Eros, and so powerful their influence, that if a chief living a full week's journey to the north were asked, What road is that? He would say, The road to Arrow. All roads in the country led to Arrow. A few years before this, a party of eight hundred natives had proceeded from the territories about the Niger to consult the Long Juju on various matters. They were led by a circuitous route to Aero Chauku, and housed in a village. Batches of from ten to twenty were regularly taken away, under pretext to the juju, but were either sacrificed or sold into servitude. Only a miserable remnant of one hundred thirty succeeded in reaching the hands of government officials. Of a totally different type were the people living to the south of the creek, called the Ibibios. They were one of the poorest races in Africa, a result largely due to the centuries of fear and oppression. Ibibio was the chief raiding ground of the headhunters, and the people lived in small isolated huts and villages deep in the forest in order to lessen the risk of capture. In demeanor they were cowed and sullen, gliding past one furtively and swiftly as if afraid. In language and life they were untruthful and filthy. The women who wore no clothing save a small piece of native cloth made of palm fiber were mere beasts of burden. All the young people went naked. Most unpromising material they seemed, yet they never ceased to draw out the sympathy and hope of the white mother of Okiyong. There was no people, she believed, who could not be recreated. She knew a great deal about the Eros and their slave system, more probably than any other white person in the country. Indeed, few had any knowledge of them. What is sad about the Aero expedition, wrote Mr. Luke, one of the Cross River pioneers, is that nearly all the town names in connection with it are unknown to those who thought we had a possible knowledge of Old Calabar. I have heard of the Eros, of Bindi, or of Aruchaku. It is somewhat humiliating that, after over fifty years as a mission, the district on the right bank should be so little known to us. Mary had first-hand acquaintance with the people. Refugees came to her from Aibo and Aibibo with stories of cruelty and wrong and oppression. Chiefs from both regions sought her out for advice and guidance. Slave dealers from Erochaku and Bindi, with their slave wares, called it Ikenj and Akpa, and with many of them she was friendly, and learned from them the secrets of their trade. She told them frankly that she was coming some day to their country, and they gave her a cordial invitation, but hinted that it might not be quite safe. It was not the danger that prevented her, she would have gone before, but the difficulty was providing for Okuyang when she was absent. She would not leave her people unless they were cared for by competent hands. She asked for two ladies to be sent in order that she might be free to carry out her idea of visiting the Arrow country, but none could be spared, and so she had perforce to wait. It was not easy, but she loyally submitted. The test of a real good missionary, she wrote, is this waiting, silent, seemingly useless time. So many who can distinguish themselves at home, missing the excitement and the results, get disconnected, morose, cynical, and deprecate everything. Everything, however, seemingly secular and small, is God's work for the moment, and worthy of our very best endeavor. To such a mission house, even in its humdrum days, is a magnificent opportunity of service. In a home like mine, a woman can find infinite happiness and satisfaction. It is an exhilaration of constant joy. I cannot fancy anything to surpass it on earth. Then came the military expedition to break up the slave system and the false gods of Aero. The troops were moved into Aerochuku by the way of the creek, and the forces of civilization encountered the warriors of barbarism in the swamps and bush that edged the waterway. When the troops entered the towns, they found juju houses everywhere, and in almost every home were rude images smeared with the blood of sacrifice. The dreaded long juju was discovered in a gloomy defile about a mile from Aerochuku, the path to it wound a tortuous way through dense bush, with others constantly leading off on both sides, evidently intended to puzzle the uninitiated. A watchtower was placed where sentinels had been posted. 
At the bottom of the valley, between high rocky banks clothed with ferns and creepers, ran a stream which widened out into a pool covered with water lilies. In the dim light was seen a small island, and upon it a rude shelter surrounded by a fence of gun barrels. Lying about were gin bottles, cooking pots, and human skulls, the witness of past orgies. At the entrance was a white goat, starving to death. Most of the chiefs had never seen a white man, and when Sir Ralph Moore went up to hold a palavar, their interest was intense. They sat on the ground, semicircle, in the shade of a giant cotton tree, suspicious and hostile, listening to the terms of the government, which included disarmament, the suppression of the juju worship, and the prohibition of the buying, pawning, and selling of slaves. After which palavar, these were agreed to. Over two thousand five hundred war guns were surrendered, but sacrifices continued, and still to some extent go on in secret in the depths of the forest. Much work also had still to be done before government rule was generally accepted. Throughout the whole time occupied by the expedition, but more particularly in the latter stages, the important chiefs kept continually in touch with Moss Lesser, and one official states that it was her influence more than all the force and power of the government emissaries that the final settlement of the country was due. It is interesting to speculate what might have been the course of events had she been able to carry out her plan before the punitive expedition was called for. Mr. Wookie goes so far as to say that had she been settled in the Arrow country, it is doubtful whether an armed expedition would have been necessary, and it is at least possible that the suppression of the slave trade would have been achieved by the peaceable means of the gospel. Primitive people often bend more quickly before Christ than break before might of arms. Number 2. Planting a Base A large tract of new territory was now open to outside influences. Who was to be the first to settle in it? Official, trader, or missionary? Mary studied the situation again in the light of the new conditions, obtaining information firsthand from officials and natives. There were two stations on the west of the Cross River, Aikoro Fiong, which, however, was really an Efik trading town, and higher up Unwana, which was a backwater and unfit for a base for inland work. Tentative efforts had been made from time to time to secure footing elsewhere, but had come to nothing, and the policy of the mission had been to continue upriver as being the line of least resistance. Her conviction was that extension, for the present at least, should take place not up the river, where the stations were cut off from the base during the dry season, but laterally across the country between the Cross River and the Niger. There was, she saw, three strategic factors which dominated the situation. The Inyong Creek, giving admission to the new territory, Aitu at its mouth, and Erochuku, the religious and political center of the Ibos. The central position of Aitu impressed her. It commanded the three regions and the people of the Ibo, the Ibibo, and Ifik and her plan was to seize and hold it as a base, then one of the towns in Erochuku, as the threshold of Iboland, and if possible, Bindi. Her views did not commend themselves to all of her colleagues in Calabar, but how wise, how foreseen, how statesmanlike was her policy, the later history of the mission proves. She felt she could do nothing until help was obtained for Ekpa. Fortunately, there is one lady missionary in Calabar who had the courage to prefer Okuyang to quieter stations. Miss Wright of the Girls' Institute, who asked the local committee to send her there as assistant to Miss Lusser, and although the committee approved, the matter was referred to the Women's Committee at home. As there seemed no prospect of anything being done, she began to move quietly along her own lines. Her school lads were now old enough and educated enough to be used as advance agents, and her hope lay in these. In January 1903, she left Akpak with two boys, Isian and an Ephiom, and one of her girls, Mana, and canoed to Aitu, and planted them there to teach school and hold services. Izian took the chief part in the latter, whilst Ifion led the singing. Mana's work was the teaching of the girls. A few weeks later, she found that the results had exceeded all her dreams. The chief said he was too old to change his ways, but the younger ones could learn the new ideas. Anyway, God had made him, and so was bound to look after him whatever sins he committed. But the children were eager to learn and made apt scholars, and people crowded to the services until there was no room for more. She went up again and selected a site on the top of the hill, with a magnificent view and built a school, speeding the work with her own hands, and set the willing people to construct a church, with two rooms for herself at the end. 
When one of her fellow missionaries, Dr. Rattery, he wrote, Bravo! Uganda was evangelized by this means, and the teachers there could only read the Gospels and could not write or count. The mission understood its business to be to spread the Gospel, and all who can read taught others and spread the news. Perhaps we educate the people too much and make them think that education is religion. When in February she heard that the Roman Catholics were intending to settle at Bindi, her heart was heavy. The thought that all that is holiest in the church should have been shed to create an opening for that corrupt body makes me ill, and not even a station opened or the hope of one. Oh, if I were able to go or send even a few of my barons just to take hold. The country is far from being at rest, but if the Roman Catholics can go, so can I. There is a great future for Nigeria, if only I were young again and had money. She wrote to Dr. Adam, a government friend in Bindi, a soldier of the church as well as a servant of the king, and he supplied her with all the information she needed. Bindi, he said, was not the place it was supposed to be. The population numbered from two to four thousand. It was not likely to become a trading center, whilst the overland transport was a disadvantage. The journey was by launch to Aitu, by steel canoe up the Inyong Creek, thence by foot or hammock to Erochuku and Bindi. He stated that Bishop Johnson of the Church Missionary Society was already in Bindi prospecting. When she received his letter, she said to herself, Shall I go? She did not wish to compromise the mission in any way, and proposed to go about the matter quietly at her own expense. She would travel, if necessary, in a hammock, as she was not so sure of herself as of old, and would find rest at wayside huts, and she would take Aya to act as interpreter, where the women did not know Ifik. I would do what I like, and would come back to my work rested and refreshed, but I want God to send me. What was influencing her also was the conviction that the end had come for her at Akpa. Again, she had the consciousness that it was time for the station to be taken over by an ordained missionary, who would build up a congregation. I shall not say that I shall leave my home without a pang, but I know that I can do work which new folk cannot do, and my days of service are closing in, and I cannot build up a church in the way a minister can. She believed that in the special conditions of West Africa, women were better than men for beginning work in the interior, and she still retained her faith in the home-trained, domesticated type, girls who had brothers and sisters and had learned to give and take and find duty in doing common things, rather than those churned out by the training schools, who were, she thought, apt to be too artificial and full of theories. Her ideal of a man missionary was Dr. Rattery, who was a good carpenter and shoemaker, and general handyman, far better accomplishments than a college education for the African field. She did not, of course, depreciate culture, so long as practical qualities of heart and hand went with it. The proposal regarding Miss Wright going to Akrap had been agreed to. She began to look forward to her advent as an event that would determine the future. Seldom had one been so eagerly watched for. For months it was nothing but, when Miss Wright comes, wait till Miss Wright comes, so on. For days before she appeared, the household was in excited mood. Every morning, fresh flowers were placed in her bedroom. The boys and girls kept themselves dressed and ready to receive her. When she did arrive, it made all the difference that was hoped. She was a capable, unselfish, plucky girl. She knew the language and was experienced in the ways of the people. Very quietly, she slipped into the methods of the house, taking the school and the dispensary off Ma's hands, and looking after the babes with the same pitying sympathy. The girls became quite at home with her in the long nights she would sing to them, recalling the times in the bush when Mr. Ovens used to entertain them. She is a right sisterly helpmate, wrote Mary, and a real help and comfort in every way. Things go as smoothly as on a summer's day, and I don't know how I got on alone. It seems too good to be true. Chapter 3. On to Erochuku On a morning of June 1908, she left Akbek for Aitu, tramping the forest path to Aikunitu in order to pick up the government launch on its weekly journey to the garrisons upriver. The government, as usual, gave her every facility for carrying on her new work, granted her free passages, took charge of her packages and letters, placed the rest houses at her disposal, and told her to ask for whatever she wanted. She did not care to trouble them unduly, but was very grateful for their consideration. On arriving at Aikunitu, she went into the teacher's house to rest, charging the boys to call her as soon as they sighted the launch. They did not notice it until it was too late for her to signal, 
and it passed onwards and out of sight. But she was not put out. Her faith was always strong in the guiding hand of God, and she turned and tramped back the same long road. When she reached the mission house, tired and weary, she assured Miss Wright that all was well. God had not meant her to travel that day, and she must have been kept back for some purpose. Next week she set out again, and when she joined the launch at Ikunitu, Colonel Montanero, the commander of the forces, was on board on his way up to Erechuku. In the course of the conversation, he gave her a pressing invitation to go there, and to accept his escort. She was almost startled by what seemed so direct a leading, but she was not prepared for a longer journey. She had no change of clothing or supply of food. She thought and prayed over the matter all the way. Here is the challenge to enter the region of unbroken gloom and despair, she mused. If it is not entered now, the Roman Catholics will come in, and the key position to the whole territory will be taken out of our hands, and only the coast tribes to be left to the mission. If I go now, we shall be the first in the field, and it will not be discourteous to the Roman Catholics, as it would be if we came afterwards. By the end of the journey, she consented to go. When she arrived at Erechuku, she found herself in the old slave center of the Eros, a densely populated district, some 80,000 people living within a radius of a few square miles. It was a strange experience to walk over these roads that had been trodden for centuries, by countless feet on the way to the pens of the coast, and the horrors of the Middle Passage, and latterly to the Efik slave market, and to gaze on the spot where the secret iniquities of the long juju had taken place. Stranger still to receive a welcome from the men who had been responsible for these evils. The chiefs and traders, many of whom she knew, were delighted with her courage and touched by her self-sacrifice, and promising to do all they could to assist her work. Making arrangements to come up later and start a school, she left, profoundly thankful for the privilege she had been granted, and praying that the church at home would have a vision for the grand opportunity opening up before it. The officials of the church, of course, knew of the opportunity, but the members at large were not interested. Dr. Robson, as, as governor of the Calabar subcommittee, pointed out how the situation was practically a crisis. No ground had been broken west of the Cross River. No teachers had been sent to the east. For a quarter of a century the supply of men had not sufficed for the existing needs of the mission, and extension had been impossible. The givings of the church for foreign missions had been below the urgent requirement. Either, he said, the staff and income must be largely increased, or they would have to step aside and invite others to divide the field with them. No adequate response was made to this and similar appeals, and the lonely pioneer was forced onwards upon her solitary path. A short time afterwards she went back to Erechuku, taking two lads, and a school was opened in the Palavar shed of Amazu, one of the towns nearest the creek. A hundred children crowded into the building along with women and men, and not a few of the old slavers, and the scholars were soon well on in the first book. In one village which she visited, she found a young trader who had brought news of the Christ religion from the Niger, and was anxious to introduce it to church and teacher. When she left the district again, the people came to the landing beach and cried after her, Don't be long in coming back, Ma. If you don't care for us, who will care for us? As her canoe was paddled down the creek, she lay back and joined the beauty of the scene. The water was as smooth as a mirror, and like a mirror reflecting the delicate tracery of the overhanging foliage. Bright birds sailed hither and thither, gorgeous butterflies flittered about, and brilliant blossoms colored the banks. She had passed in succession two snakes attempting to cross the stream, and was watching the efforts of a third when a small canoe shot out from behind a clump of bushes and bumped into her craft. She apologized to the man in it, but standing cap in hand he said, I meant it, Ma. I have been waiting for you. My master at Akani Bobayo sent me to waylay you and bring you to his house. Taking a letter from his cap, he handed it to her. The canoe was turned and entered a small creek, a picture of delicate loveliness with multitudes of lilies and other aquatic plants, which made her feel as if she was moving through an exquisite dream. A shingling beach, evidently a busy trading place, was reached, and there stood a young man and young woman, handsome and well-dressed, who assisted her to land. They led her into a good house and into a pretty room with concrete floor, a European bedstead, clean and dainty, with mosquito curtains, and all the appointments that indicated people of taste. The man was Onoyom Ayanaya, a born statesman, the only one in the district who had not been disarmed by the government, and the one who had been chosen president of the native court, and was shaping well as a wise and enlightened ruler. 
It was a moving story that Mary heard from his lips while his wife stood by and listened. It went back to 1875 when he was a boy. One day a white man appeared in the creek, and all the people decamped and hid. He alone stayed on the beach, and in a response to a request from the white man, offered to lead him to the chief's house. During the palaver that ensued, he lingered by, an absorbed listener. When the white man left, he was tried by the heads of the town and severely punished for having acted as guide. The stranger was the Reverend Dr. Robb, one of the ablest missionaries in the mission, then stationed at Ikorof Young. The boy never forgot the incident, but he grew up a heathen and went to the cannibal feast at Eruchuku. When his father died, ten little girls were slaughtered, and five of the bodies were placed beneath the corpse and five above that they might occupy the position of wives in the spirit world. He married, but misfortune seemed to dog him. His house was burned down. Then his child died. Seeking for the man who had wrought these things by witchcraft in order to murder him, he met a native who had once been a mission teacher in Calabar, but who had fallen into evil ways and was now homeless and drunken. How do you know, the latter said, that it is not the god of the white man that is angry with you? He is all-powerful. Where can I find this god? the chief inquired. I am not worthy to say, but go to the white ma at Aitu, and she will tell you. I will go, was the reply. He took a canoe and watched for Mary on the creek, but missed her. In his impatience he engaged the old teacher, who had still his Bible, to come and read Aiko Abasi to him. Again he sent for ma, but she had gone on to Eruchuku. Then he kept a man on the lookout in the creek, and it was he who had intercepted her. And now will you show me what to do? As he told the story, several big, fattened ladies had come in, and a number of children and dependents. She prayed with them, sent for the teacher's Bible, and talked with them long and earnestly. The chief's wife made her a cup of tea, and she left, promising to come later and see what she could do to develop a station. The detour had made her late, and the canoe ran into a sudden storm of wind and rain. But her heart was jubilant, and kept singing and praying all the way to Aitu. For God was good. He was leading her, and that was perfect happiness. Chapter 4. A Slave Girl's Triumph The problem was how to follow up so promising a beginning. It occupied her thoughts day and night, but she came to the conclusion that she could not conscientiously leave Mrs. Wright alone at Akpa. The station was too isolated for her, and if she became ill it might be weeks before anyone knew. An alternative was to remain herself at Akpa and allow Mrs. Wright to go on to Aitu, where she would be in touch with the mission, and could canoe down to Calabar if anything went wrong. The plan she liked best was to hand the station over to a minister, so that both she and Miss Wright could establish themselves at Aitu and work the creek between them. As the months went by and she paid flying visits to the infant causes at Aitu and Amasu, she became more and more convinced of the magnificent opportunity lying to the church's hand in these regions. At Aitu, the congregation had grown to one of over three hundred intelligent and well-dressed people meeting in a church built by themselves. In August, at Amazu, she found a school of sixty-eight on a wet day, and of these, thirty-eight could read the first book. That they had been brought under their discipline was shown by the fact that, as she entered, all rose silently and simultaneously, as if they had been years instead of weeks at school. The same month witnessed an event which gave her unbounded happiness. Jean and Mana, the slave girl, Aya, the twin mother of Susie, Akomo, the first fruit of Ikenj, and Isien, the teacher at Aitu, were baptized, and sat down at the communion table. Many others were there, and joined in spirit in the celebration, but owing to difficult native complications, could not take the step, and Mary never cared to force matters. Isien's mother had been very unwilling for her son to come under Christian influence, and now she was not only present, but actually sat beside two twin mothers. Ekoma's face was transfigured. Jean's adopted child, Dan, was also baptized on the occasion, and it was a great and solemn joy to Mary to see her oldest baron give him to God and promise to bring him up in his fear. In October she was at Aitu watching the building of the house for herself and teacher, and nothing delighted her more than the way in which the women worked along with the men. I wish Crockett had been here to gather the shafts and sparks of wit and satire that flew with as much zest as ever obtained in a Galloway Brie or Market Fairing. It is such a treat to me, for no intercourse is permitted between the sexes in Okayang, except that of the family, and then it is strained and unnatural. But here they were daffin and laughing, as in Scotland. How wholesome are God's own laws of freedom and simplicity! The house was to have six rooms, three for herself, one for Miss Wright or other lady missionary, 
one for Mana, and one for Isien and Ifiomo. I'm afraid that is too much for me, she said, thinking of the mats which were not easy to obtain. It's not too much, Ma. Nothing can be too much. We will do it. One woman came and insisted on washing her feet in hot water. She had to give in, and as she sat down, the woman said, Ma, I've been so frightened you would take our teacher away because we are so unworthy. I think I could not live again in darkness. I pray all the time. I lay my basket down and just pray on the road. This woman sometimes prayed in the meetings and electrified the audience, and she had begun to have devotions in her own home, though her husband laughed at her. There were many others of the same type. It was a slave girl who had been the one behind it all. Mana taught and nursed and trained them, quietly and modestly, as a mother might. It was an inspiration to Mary to see her, and she looked upon such results, she cried. Oh, if only the church knew, if only it would back us up. To her friends she wrote, Prayer can do anything. Let us try its power. Returning to Akpap with two of the girls and some small children, she was caught in a tornado and made her way over the six miles of bush road through pelting rain. The darkness was lit up by almost continuous lightning, but they lost their way, and she had at last to commandeer an old native to lead them. Such experiences were now part of her ordinary life again. On her trips up and down the creek, she was constantly drifting into strange situations and being reduced to sleeping on mud floors or on straw in the open, drinking tea made in empty milk tins and subsisting for days on yams and oranges. And always she was treated by the natives with as much gallantry and courtesy as if she were a queen. And always she was singing in her heart psalms of thanksgiving and gratitude. But she was not able as formerly to resist the effects of such exposure, and was often weary, and her weariness brought nervousness and lack of sleep. At times she was afraid of the unknown future opening out before her, and appalled when she thought of all the details of labor, supplies, and management that were coming upon her shoulders. In the dark she would rise and cry, Calm me, O God, and keep me calm. Then she would go and look at the sleeping children, and comfort herself with the sight. Surely, she would say, I have more reason to trust God than childhood has after all the way he has led me.